Well, hello everyone and welcome to this lecture about money and inflation. Uh, my name is Dr. David Smurden. This lecture will assume some background knowledge in macroeconomic fundamentals and in particular the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. But even if you haven't had a chance to brush over those things, um, the lecture should still be reasonably self-explanatory. Okay, so I'll just pop my video down there and we'll go to the slides. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start off by talking about what money is, which sounds like a philosophical question, but we'll see it's quite important. We'll introduce some new uh, economic agents into our analysis, in particular the financial institutions. We'll talk a bit about monetary policy, commercial banks and the creation of money, the money market, and finally get on to inflation. So what is money? Like I said, it sounds like a strange sort of question to ask in economics. Most people would say, well, it's the notes and coins we carry around in our wallet. But when you think about it, actually most transactions that you conduct on a daily basis are not done in cash. You might be paying using your cashless credit card, your phone, your smartwatch. You might be setting up automatic bank transfers to pay your rent or your bills and so forth. So we can see that money as it actually matters to our economy is a lot more than just the, the physical uh, notes and coins. There are a couple of key properties for money. The first is that it can be used as a medium of exchange. So instead of bartering between say vegetables and fruit between buyers and sellers, you use money as a way to facilitate that exchange. The second as a store of value, meaning you can sell your tomatoes, take the money away and use that money later to pay uh, as if you were paying with the value of those tomatoes. And the third, it's a unit of account. So it's got this accounting function um, that we can put on our spreadsheets and that we can uh, use a common unit for. So with these three properties, actually many things uh, could be money and many things have been money throughout history. Um, in, the, uh, in the old days, um, precious stones and metals such as gold and silver have been used. Uh, beads have been used as by the American Indians rocks, bottle caps. Uh, during a period of time in Colombia, cocaine was one of the main means of money um, for transactions. In, in prisons, you get some strange things such as cigarettes, but also urine, particularly when there's a lot of um, drug testing going on. Um, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, a science fiction series, uh, a primitive Earth-like civilization uses leaves from the trees uh, as their means of money. Now that wasn't very successful and we can see one of the reasons why when we look at the features of money that really matter. So it needs to be acceptable by most people, otherwise it can't be a medium of exchange or a store of value. It needs to be durable so it doesn't easily deteriorate by wear or tear and we, we start to see why tree leaves might not be such a good idea. Interestingly, Australia hasn't given that many inventions to the world, but one thing we did give was the plastic banknote and the first waterproof uh, banknote, which is now being taken up uh, around the world. It needs to be transportable, standardized, and divisible. So money, a $50 note, can be divided up down into $10 notes, $5 notes, and then the coins and so forth. Like I said, throughout history, different things have been used. Silver has been one of the most common ones um, particularly thanks to its introduction by the Roman Empire, which was such a, a wide-spanning empire. Uh, however, the Romans weren't familiar with macroeconomic policy, uh, mainly because macroeconomics as a field only really developed out of the uh, Great Depression of the 1920s. So they were a fair bit earlier than that, which meant that they made a few mistakes that we can pick up in our basic textbooks these days. One of them being that they thought that they could get away with simply devaluing the currency in their own sneaky way whenever they got into trouble by reducing the amount of silver within the coins. And by the time we got to the crisis of the third century with Emperor Claudius, actually the silver coins only had 5% silver in each one. Okay, 
Going a bit deeper then, there are two forms of money that are interesting to us. The first is commodity money, such as silver or gold. That's when the physical money itself has some intrinsic value. The most common one that we encounter though is fiat money. So fiat money, the money itself, like a banknote, doesn't have any intrinsic value, but because of people's belief that it is a genuine, reputable piece of currency issued by a governmental authority and that you can use it in different places that you go, such as the next cafe or when you go shopping, it's got that value that comes from that uh, function from its beliefs rather than anything intrinsic. So it's usually issued by a central bank in Australia. That means the Reserve Bank of Australia um, because they're in the best position to be able to meet those five features we spoke about for money. So now we're going to go into further definitions of money. Um, as I mentioned, the monetary base is a lot more than just coins and notes because many of your daily day day-to-day -day transactions wouldn't involve those things and certainly for, for most people so the monetary base we'll talk about is this currency plus any reserves held at the central bank but most banks don't actually keep physical currency to the value of everyone's deposit in their vaults so if we want to know what money is uh, what the money flow is like in our society. We need different sort of definitions. Reserve Bank has different definitions. We'll look at two of those. M1, which is physical currency plus current deposits at commercial banks. So current deposits are the ones that you can withdraw from very easily, such as your check and savings account. And then M3, we take that M1 definition and we add a few more things. So ones where it's a little bit more difficult to withdraw very quickly or at least you have to pay a penalty, such as term deposits, for example. We'll actually see that M3 is much bigger than M1. So if we look at the measure of money supply in Australia, we can see that M3 is much bigger than M1, and M1 is also a fair bit bigger than the monetary base. So now let's introduce a few of our new economic players. These are the financial institutions. We've already mentioned the Reserve Bank of Australia. The other is the commercial banks. Now in Australia, we've had this oligopoly for a long period of time with the big four banks. Recently, there's been a little bit of pushback against that, um, that uh, oligopoly, that sort of dynasty that they've built up, largely on account of some findings coming from the Royal Banking Commission. But they provide financial services, such as deposits and loans and investment products, not just to you and me in households, but very importantly to firms as well that enable them, for example, to invest. Our second player, the Reserve Bank of Australia, has three key objectives that are set for it. The first is the stability of the Australian currency. The second is to try to maintain full employment in Australia. Now, full employment has a very specific economic definition. It does not mean that uh, everyone is employed, but for the purposes of this lecture, you can just think about full employment as being trying to keep unemployment very, very low. And the third, a very general comment about the economy, it is uh, to promote the economic prosperity and welfare of the Australian people. Now, it has some particular functions that help us to help it to do these things. The first, it is the only issuer of national currency. There is some debate about this because there are actually some other institutions that can issue national currency at a very small scale. But for the moment, that's one of its key functions. We can just simplify it that way. The second, it is the banker of banks. So it is the banker to the commercial banks and also to the government. And we'll talk about how it can use that soon. And the third, it is the lender of last resorts to the banks. This ties in to point number two. So it uses this second function about being the banker of banks to implement monetary policy. So when we talk about the two sorts of macroeconomic interventions, we'll talk about monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy with money, Reserve Bank of Australia. Fiscal policy, government. Think about it that way, this division of the two institutions. So the way that it implements monetary policy is by influencing the money supply, in particular the quantity of money supply. It does this through something that's called the channel system. 
whereby the central bank can influence the rate at which it borrows and lends to commercial bank. And that then flows down to the market interest rates that you and I see when we, for instance, look at term deposits or how much we have to pay on our, for violating, a, violating our credit cards or mortgages and things like that. They're all stemming from what the central bank is doing um, to, to the interest rates. So how does the channel system work? Well, every day there are many, many transactions that happen between the commercial banks in Australia. For instance, you may transfer money from your Commonwealth Bank account to your landlord's account, which might be from National Australia Bank, for example. There are many of these happening at a much larger scale. Also, big firms are doing this. At the end of the day, the banks need to clear their debts with each other. So they need to clear the daily transactions using their accounts that they have with the central bank, with the RBA. So if one bank is short of money to clear its transactions because it hasn't held enough commercial reserves, it can borrow in this market, which is called the overnight market. It has to pay a price when you borrow money. You know what the price is. You know what the disadvantage is, is of taking out a loan. It's that you have to pay interest. So that price is the interest rate. So some definitions then, the interest rate is the amount paid per dollar borrowed per year, usually expressed per year, as a percentage of the amount borrowed. You know what an interest rate is already. What, the way you need to think about it here is that it's the price of borrowing money. In a way, an interest rate serves as something like an opportunity cost of holding money. The cash rate is a particular type of interest rate. It's the interest charged by one bank to another for the privilege of being able to borrow in this overnight interbank market. Now, we can see that the cash rates um, generally follow each other reasonably closely. Here are some examples where we've got the uh, RBA, also the Central Bank of New Zealand, and the Fed, which is the central bank in the US. Um, this is their effective cash rate. We can see that the US uh, tracked ours pretty closely up until about 2001, where it started to drop. And then ever since the global financial crisis, which was spurred on by the subprime mortgage crisis in the US, that uh, effective rate has dropped to around zero, although it's starting to pick up now. So what if the bank can't borrow or lend enough in this market and it's still got debts to clear overnight? Well, then they can borrow or lend to the RBA. So if they don't have enough, then they can borrow from the RBA. If they've got too much and it's not doing anything, then there's an opportunity cost to holding onto that money. They should lend it to the RBA to at least get some income back from that. So in both of these cases, the RBA offers them a slightly worse rate than they would otherwise get in the overnight cash rate, usually about 0.25% um, higher or lower, depending whether it's borrowing or lending. And this cash rate really matters because, like I said, the interest rates that we see on a daily basis that firms and households face are essentially a risk-adjusted uh, markup on the cash rate. So they're higher, but by about the same amount, that same amount being a risk adjustment because it's slightly riskier to loan to a household than it is to loan to another commercial bank, which in turn is slightly riskier than loaning to the central bank. So you can see here that the um, different interest rates in Australia follow each other very, very closely, just with a little bit of a distance above uh, each line or below each line. That's that risk markup. And the risk markup does change a little bit over time, depending on whether or not um, people believe that certain uh, groups to lend to, it's going to be a little bit more of a riskier transaction or a little bit safer. Okay, so we've introduced our key players. Now it's time to turn to monetary policy. Monetary policy, that's the what we call the mechanisms that the central bank uses to control the supply of money. It controls the supply of money so that it can influence the interest rate. By doing so, it will influence the inflation rate. And we know that this has an impact on the decisions of firms and households. If you're familiar with the ADAS model, you'll know how important changes to the interest rate and inflation rate are for a lot of those key components of GDP, particularly consumption 
and investment. In Australia, our monetary policy is largely to do with the setting of an appropriate um, target cash rate by the RBA. It typically does this to target inflation. Now in Australia, they try to target it to be around two to 3% per annum on average over the business cycle with slight fluctuations, of course. And what the central bank then does is adjust the quantity of money that it supplies to try to keep within that narrow branch of inflation. Now, it's not possible for the RBA to just act like a government and say, we are setting the interest rate at 2.5%, and that's the end of the story. The interest rate comes from this overnight market in the first place. And like any market, the price, remember the price for borrowing money is the interest rate. The price comes about uh, automatically through the market mechanisms, so through the power of supply and demand. So the RBA can set a target cash rate, but it's then got to try to influence, particularly the supply of money, to try to um, to let the market forces through the price mechanism get it as close as possible to that target cash rate. So the way that it does this, the way that it influences the monetary supply is through open market operations. And that's essentially the buying and selling of uh, government bonds or, or treasury securities to and from commercial banks to influence the cash rate. So for example, if the RBA wants to increase the monetary base, it would buy government or treasury bonds from commercial banks. When you buy something, it's in exchange for money. So they're removing treasury bonds from circulation, but they're giving money to the commercial banks. So that's increasing the reserve amounts that commercial banks have. So they've now got more money in their reserves, which means they're less likely to need to borrow in the overnight market. If they're less likely to need to borrow. That's going to put downward pressure on the price in this money market, which is the interest rate. On the other hand, if the RBA wanted to decrease the monetary base, it would do it the other way around. It would sell these government securities or treasury bonds to commercial banks. The banks would buy these, so therefore it would have to spend money decreasing its own reserve accounts. And that increases the chance that a commercial bank needs to borrow in the overnight market because there's a higher chance of needing to borrow. That's putting, that's essentially putting more demand on the price of money it's going to increase the interest rate. So imagine that the economy is growing too fast. It's overheating. So what does the government, uh, sorry, what does the central bank need to do? Well, in this sort of case, we basically want firms to pull back a bit on investment and we want households to pull back a bit on consumption. So how do we do that? We increase the interest rate because with higher interest rates, Firms are less likely to invest by borrowing money. It's more expensive now. Households are more likely to save money. They're getting a good rate in fixed term deposit, less likely to spend money. So that will help cool down the economy. So it needs to increase interest rates. How's it going to do that? The RBA is going to sell government securities to the banks. The banks are going to buy them using money, decreasing the bank's commercial sorry, the cash reserves, increasing the chances that the banks will need to borrow in the overnight market, which puts upward pressure on the price of borrowing money, the end result being an increase in interest rates. Let's look at the reverse. Imagine that the economy is a little bit sluggish, a little bit behind where its um, potential uh, output could be. And the government needs to stimulate it. So it needs to stimulate people to buy stuff. It needs to stimulate firms to borrow. So it wants to lower the cash rate. The central bank usually also doesn't just do this silently. It makes this announcement because uh, as you may recall, just the belief that um, there's going to be a lower cash rate in the future or, or lower inflation can stimulate people to act in a way, firms and households to act in a way with this belief actually becomes the reality, so-called self-fulfilling prophecy. So, okay, so the central bank announces a lower cash rate, which is going to 
stimulate borrowing. It's cheaper to borrow now, so you can borrow more to buy more stuff. You're less likely to want to keep your money in fixed term deposits. And in particular, firms are wanting to borrow so that they can increase their investment. That's going to increase GDP in total. So how does the bank do this to reduce interest rates? Well, it actually buys back um, government securities from the commercial banks. It does that in exchange for money that increases the cash reserves that the banks have, decreases the chances that they need to borrow in the overnight market, uh, which is going to put downward pressure on interest rates. Now, I appreciate that this can be a little bit confusing, in particular, the idea that the central bank and the commercial banks get together each night in this overnight market where there are so-called government securities and treasury bonds. It sounds like something a little bit out of a fairy tale. Um, in reality, these are not things that you and I see every day, a government bond, or perhaps you had no knowledge of the overnight market before. You only really need to know about these things in the sense that this so-called channel system is the way that the RBA affects the money supply. And that's the important thing, that the RBA can affect the money supply in order to be able to affect the interest rates. And that's how it connects to the rest of the macroeconomics that we're interested in. So in a sense, what the bank is doing is creating money. And it's using the commercial banks to do that. So we have seen that the RBA sets this target cash rate and then engages through the channel system in these so-called open market operations to affect um, the quantity of cash reserves that the commercial banks hold. But now we'll work through a little example to see exactly how this changes the quantity of money. And the important thing to note here is that we have a so-called fractional reserve system. So what matters is that the commercial banks within Australia don't hold all of the deposits in reserves in their vaults, but only a fraction, and they use the rest to make profitable loans. So when you uh, deposit $1,000 in the bank, the bank doesn't actually keep that sitting somewhere in a, in a vault in their buildings. It'll only keep a little bit of it, and the rest it will use to try and make a profit in some sense. So what that means is that um, at any given time, if everybody who's a customer of, say, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia went to try to withdraw their money, there simply would not be enough money in there. You'd have to wait. And this is where this uh, concept of bank runs come from. So when there's panic, such as during the global financial crisis, there would be runs on the bank where people would queue up, want to take money out, there wouldn't be enough money there, which would spook people that get more panicked. More people would want to come and try to extract money. You get this sort of avalanche, which we call a bank run. The same thing happened in recent years uh, during the Greece uh, debt crisis. Um, there was uh, a lot of panic happening in Greece in the wake of these um, massive uh, debt to GDP ratio stemming from some of the actions taken during the financial crisis. Um, one result of that was that actually the government imposed that people could only take 60 euros or about 100 Australian dollars out of an ATM on any given day. And there would still be queues in Greece to be able to take that money out um, to get their 60 euros per day. The government had to put that in place because otherwise this panic would spread to these bank runs and there simply wouldn't be enough cash reserves on hand. Okay, so why am I telling you about this? Well, this overnight market, it seems like it wouldn't have enough power for the RBA to be able to make a significant impact on the quantity of money supplied throughout an entire economy. The way that the, uh, that the RBA can do this is thanks to this fractional system whereby the money that the RBA injects is actually multiplied throughout the economy. Sounds a little bit like magic, but I'll show you how it works with a simple accounting example. So in this example, to make it simple, we'll assume that all banks keep about 10% of their deposits at reserves. Um, in reality, banks do 
have uh, different amounts that they keep and it can also be um, this example could also be made more complicated because uh, banks loan at different rates to different sorts of customers and so forth but let's just see how the money multiplier works in practice so in a fractional reserve banking system as i mentioned banks just hold a fraction of the money deposited the reserves are those that they're hanging on to and the reserve ratio is then the fraction of deposits that the banks are holding as reserves. So if it's 10% and you deposit $1,000, the bank holds on to 100 and it can do whatever it wants with the other 900, usually loaning it out to make money. So the money supply is affected by the amount that's deposited in the banks and then the amount that the banks loan out. The loans are an asset to the bank and so we'll see that on their balance sheet. So we'll look at a couple of simple T-sheets here. So Suppose in our example that the RBA buys back a $1,000 bond from town. So $1,000 bond being bought back means that the RBA is paying with $1,000. So the RBA is injecting $1,000 into the account. Now, we'll assume that Tian is a customer of some bank, the Bank of Alexandria. So that means that the RBA transfers $1,000 from the government's account to the Bank of Alexandria. So that goes onto the um, Bank of Alexandria's balance sheet there. <clears throat> now, with a 10% uh, ratio, the Bank of Alexandria will keep $100 in reserves and can do whatever it wants with that other $900. Let's assume that it loans it out and it loans out $900 to Emily, another customer of another bank. So Emily takes this $900 and she buys a sofa from someone called Julian. So Julian takes this $900 and deposits it in his bank called Olympia Bank. So that now $900 now gets recorded as an asset on Olympia Bank's balance sheet. So what that means is that this $1,000 injection has created $1,000 plus $900 if we add up the assets of the commercial banks that have benefited from this injection. It seems a little bit like a pyramid scheme or magic. The point is, thanks to this fractional reserve system, on the asset sheets of our commercial banks, we've now got $1,900. Okay, so Olympia Bank keeps 10% of the 900, which is 90, and loans out 810 to Sanvi. Sanvi takes the 810 and buys an espresso machine from Kofi, Kofi deposits 810 in his bank account at Colossus Bank. So we've now got another bank where 810 is being recorded on the asset side of things. So what does that mean? Well, now we've got 1,000 plus 900 plus 810 all coming from that initial 1,000 injection. Now what happens if we keep going, following the money trail and see what happens at the end of it? Well, if we kept going like this, we'd eventually find that the money that's been created in our economy from this $1,000 is about $10,000. As a formula for this, the formula involves this reserve ratio, but typically the one over the reserve ratio is given a special name that we use more often, which is the money multiplier. In addition, well, basically, in, in essence, what it means is the, the RBA putting some money in then gets multiplied throughout the economy in the sense it's been multiplied by 10. Now, like I said, this depends in reality on a few other things, the different ratios that are kept and other things like this. But in general, the fact is that the money is going to be multiplied, which means that the RBA can make a substantial impact on the supply of money uh, in, in the economy through its uh, injections. Now, there are a couple of issues for the RBA in controlling the supply of money. We're not gonna talk about them too much, but there are two problems that do arise from the fractional reserve banking scheme. One is that it, the RBA can't control the amount of money that households choose to hold as deposits in banks. They can do other things with their money and that's out of the RBA's control, nor does it uh, have any control about the amount of the money that bankers choose to lend. So these are some of the issues that the RBA has to deal with. Okay, so that gives you a sort of a broad overview of the role that the RBA plays in society and some of the mechanisms that it uses. Now let's see how that translates into the market for money.
So this is the graph that we're going to try to get to. We're going to build it up over the next couple of slides. I've got a few strange things here compared to a normal market for a product that we might have seen in microeconomics. So we don't have price, for example, on the y-axis, but I standing for the interest rate. On the x-axis, instead of quantity, we've got quantity of money, but here it's M over P, and that's because the money market assumes that prices and income are constant. Uh, income being measured by Y. You can think about it in terms of GDP per capita, for example. So prices and income are constant in this market. That's why we've got M over P. You'll also notice we've got a perfectly elastic supply curve for money and a downward sloping demand curve. Let's start with the demand curve and try to work out why that's downward sloping. So we know what it means to demand hamburgers and as the price goes up, we demand fewer hamburgers. Why would we demand less money when the price of money goes up? Okay, so households and firms both can hold money so that they can undertake different transactions. What's the alternative? What's the next best thing? Because as we know, when we think about um, value and prices in a microeconomic market, we're talking about opportunity cost, the next best alternative. So the next best alternative is to hold assets that aren't money, but which can earn you some interest. So for example, buying bonds, investing in shares, putting it in term deposits, things like that. When the interest rate is high, then the opportunity cost of holding money, for instance, stuffing it under your mattress at home, is high. You could be doing a lot better if you weren't doing that, which means that the quantity demanded of money is low. On the other hand, when the interest rate is really low, you could keep the money under your mattress if you want. It doesn't make much difference. In that case, you're willing to hold on to more money than you otherwise would. So the quantity of money demanded is high. So we put those together onto our graph and we find that the um, demand for money slopes down. <clears throat> what about monetary, um, what about money supply? Well, um, to change, to change this slide. Um, we know that the current Australian monetary policy and that's set by most um, economies around the world is to have a target inflation rate. And that means that the RBA needs to be able to adjust the supply of reserves very, very quickly to achieve that target. So essentially what the RBA is doing is adjusting the amount of money supply, the quantity of money supply, as we've seen through the channel system, in order to maintain a constant interest rate. If we've got a constant interest rate, then we're gonna have a horizontal line at whatever that target interest rate is, which means that the money supply curve is perfectly elastic. And that's how we get this graph. So the good news for us is that equilibrium is just as we've normally seen it in our basic microeconomic models. It's the intersection of supply and demand. But we can also think about this uh, a little bit differently. So the equilibrium point, we don't really think about it in terms of an equilibrium price because that's already decided in advance by the RBA. That's the target cash rate. So in a sense, what this is saying is um, the market equilibrium gives us the quantity of money supplied by the RBA given its target cash rate for a given demand for money. Yeah, so the RBA is responding by choosing the quantity of money to supply. Now, like we've said, this is conditional on prices, taking prices as given, but also taking income as given. So what happens if income rises? Well income rises, the consumers are going to have more disposable money, same for firms, there's going to be uh, more money demanded for any given interest rate. And if that demand is going to go up to, to uh, prevent inflationary pressures from taking over, the RBA is going to increase the quantity of money. So the rise in income is going to lead to a shift out of the demand curve 
and the response from the RBA is going to increase the amount of money supplied in order to maintain that target interest rate level. So time to turn to monetary policy and how it relates to the money market. The central bank may respond in different ways to changes in income, which we can think about here as changes in GDP, GDP per capita being some sort of proxy for income. For example, from a change to the aggregate demand curve. And so from this point, we're going to refer back to the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. If you haven't gone over that sort of material yet, I suggest you do a quick pause here, do a bit of a refresher and then come back. So like I said, the central bank's trying to preserve its target cash rate. If it wants to do that, there are two types of policy we talk about. Fairly straightforward. One is expansionary monetary policy. The other is contractionary. So expansionary monetary policy corresponds with an increase in the quantity of money supplied and expansion. The result being is that it lowers the target cash rate. Contractionary monetary policy is the opposite. So you're decreasing or contracting the quantity of money supplied, which leads to an increase or rising a target cash rate. So let's take example first on the left there of expansionary monetary policy. Remember, if the uh, RBA is engaging in expansionary monetary policy, its aim is to lower the interest rate. It will often announce it in that way. It'll announce not that we are increasing the money supply, but that we are engaging in expansionary monetary policy or that we are lowering the target cash rate. So it increases the uh, quantity of money supplied and then conditional on prices and income and the money demand curve, that's going to, as you can see, lower the interest rate, both the target interest rate of the RBA, the cash rate in the overnight market, and then that will flow on to the interest rates that you and I see every day, and that affects consumers, households, and firm decisions. Contractionary monetary policy, exactly the opposite. Essentially, the RBA, by contracting the amount of money supplied or decreasing it, is going to increase that target interest rate. Now, what's interesting is that how aggressive an RBA uh, uh, is in its monetary policy operations impacts the slope of the AD curve. So it impacts the shape of the AD curve, which is a very strange sort of um, relationship when you first think about it. I mean, we're talking about the responsiveness of the RBA in the money market, and somehow that's affecting the shape of the AD curve uh, in, in our overall economy market, which is strange because we thought typically think of the AD curve as being affected by consumer demand, firm demand, demand for exports, government spending, those sort of things. So let's see why it could affect the steepness. Let's suppose that there is some sort of shock to the economy that's going to affect our AD curve. So for example, an increase in the demand for Australian exports that will shift the AD curve to the right, as we've seen before. <clears throat> So let's see this on the left in the case of quite a responsive central bank. Take the case of Australia, for example. Australia, uh, one of the, the countries around the world where we've got this independent central bank that is quite responsive and that tries to engage in, in strong macroeconomic policy. So we're looking at the same distance right would shift to the AD curve and we'll see how that uh, then flows on to the equilibrium effects for both a responsive and non-responsive central bank. So in the case of a responsive central bank, that increase, uh, that shift to the right, as we know, puts upward pressure on inflation. More demand now, upward pressure on inflation. However, the RBA is going to be quite responsive to this. So it's going to um, raise in the target interest rate when it raises the target interest rate, we know that that's going to uh, pull back a little bit, cool down consumption, so spending by households, and also investment decisions uh, by firms because it's now more expensive to borrow. It's going to cool down the economy a little bit. So the end result is going to be that we're now going to move 
from going across to the right up and to the left along AD curve one, which is going to lead to a new inflation uh, level that's higher than before in pi one versus pi zero. And as we've seen before, the final result actually is a movement along the short run aggregate supply curve. So initially we move to the right a long way, so a big increase in Y. The upward inflationary pressure uh, then is um, addressed to some extent by the responsiveness of the RBA, which raises the interest rates, which leads to this further move, a decrease in Y, so we're now gonna end up at Y1, an increase in pi, but not by that much. So an increase in the inflation rate, but not by that much. Okay, let's look at exactly the same example, the same rightward shift in the AD curve. So this distance here is going to be the same, but we're going to have a steep curve now. The steepness of the curve represents an unresponsive central bank. So it's the same horizontal distance. Again, we're going to lead to a big increase in output, puts pressure on inflation to rise. If the central bank doesn't do anything to change interest rates, then that pressure is going to lead to this movement up the AD curve. So first to the right and then up the new AD curve. We're gonna end up in a point where the economy is still quite overheated and inflation has risen by quite a lot. So expansionary and contraction, contractionary monetary policy, the ways that the government, uh, the government, excuse me, that the RBA can respond to things that are going on in the economy, particularly um, in pressure on inflation. But there are actually other reasons that the RBA may want to engage in some sort of monetary policy. And if it does this, this is actually going to lead to shifts in the AD curve. So why would the RBA want to respond if it's not for one of these inflationary pressure reasons? Well, one reason it's quite topical at the moment in Australia is an asset price bubble. So for example, the housing market. If you think that the Australian housing market is turning into an asset price bubble, which a lot of economists do, then as the RBA, you might want to try to cool down what's going on in that asset market. Now, the housing market is such a big market in Australia for an asset class that it makes some sense for the RBA to want to intervene. It might do so by raising interest rates. It raises interest rates, then uh, households are less likely to uh, get a mortgage because it's now more expensive. So this is a contractionary policy change, but for a different reason, an exogenous reason we say, that's going to lead to a leftward shift in the AD curve. So we call this exogenous because it's not related to current inflation, it's due to something else. And like I said, that shifts the AD curve. All right. We've covered central banks, money creation, other financial institutions, market for money, and uh, monetary policy. Put it all together, and we get our last topic for this lecture, which is on inflation. And inflation is a term that you've heard many times before, no doubt, in the media and in the news. It measures the changes in the aggregate price level over time, essentially how much more expensive goods are getting. Um, the inflation rate is usually measured on an annual basis, but it corresponds to the month or the quarter the year before to account for seasonal differences. So for example, around uh, December, Christmas time, people are spending a lot more in general. It makes a lot more sense to compare December of 2019 to December of 2018, just to account for those difference in December and other months. Inflation targeting, one more definition, is simply the use of monetary policy with this goal of keeping inflation within a particular band, a narrow band. And actually the RBA has done a pretty good job of that in recent years. You can see here that since 1993, the average rate of price changes is 2.6%. And it's been relatively smooth. In fact, it's been getting smoother and smoother in some sense, although a few mini little spikes here around the time of the global financial crisis, but before that, pretty smooth. Certainly way before that, we were not doing a very good job about keeping within this range. This sort of reflects how 
macroeconomic policy for um, for countries around the world is a relatively new field. Like I said, it came out of the Great Depression um, in the early 20th century, and we're getting better and better at understanding it now. So why is the RBA trying to keep this narrow range of inflation? Well, it's all got to do with uncertainty. Now humans, whether you're uh, household consumers or whether you're firms or even governments or banks, you don't typically like uncertainty. You like to know that the sort of the standard of living you're having now is going to continue into the future. You don't like big shocks to that. Certainly shocks that go up and make your life better would be great, but if they come with equally a likely downward shock, you prefer just to keep things nice and smooth. This is particularly important for workers, also firms, but for workers who want to know what wages uh, and, and prices will be worth in terms of what you can buy in the future. So for instance, if I sign a contract with, uh, with my employer and I'm going to get a 3% wage rise every year for the next five years, I don't like finding out into my second year that inflation is 30% because it essentially means I'm getting poorer and poorer and poorer every year. I don't like that. I like knowing that my 3% raise is going to correspond with the 3% increase in prices so I can um, plan for my future. Firms also need to be able to plan for their future in terms of the expenses that they spend on wages. So that's one reason. The second reason is that higher inflation rates are typically also associated with more volatile inflation rates. So you don't like this volatility because it leads to high inflation. And typically that means that the returns on investments are more uncertain. Now, if you do a little bit of study into financial markets, you'll see that when this return is particularly uncertain, it typically puts off a lot of investors from getting in the market. That's gonna decrease your investment in general. <clears throat> so what's this rate then that the central bank should be aiming for? Why do we have this 2.5, 2.6%? Well, actually, it's possible for banks to choose different rates. There's not a perfect amount. And if you look on the right hand side here, you can actually see the different banks around the world have um, different levels that they aim for, typically around about 2%, although some like the Bank of Indonesia are a little bit higher. Same for the Bank of Mexico. Low rates are good. So low rates reduce volatility and reduce the impact on, of big inflation on people who are relying on nominal income. So they're relying on the dollar amount written into the contracts all the time, such as pensioners who are getting an annual pension rate every year. You want to have low inflation for them so they're not losing out too much. But okay, why not zero them? Well, zero is not good because if you have some small swings, it might actually lead to negative uh, inflation, which we call deflation. That's when prices are expected to fall in the future. Now, if you know that prices are expected to fall in the future, you're not going to buy stuff now. Certainly the consumables that you have to buy, like your fruit and vegetables and milk, okay, you'll buy that. But for big sort of purchases or durable purchases, you're not going to um, buy them now. It's going to reduce household consumption. Firms are also going to postpone their investment. It's going to lead to a vicious cycle by which output falls. So this is kind of a sweet spot that central banks have typically agreed upon, which is to have a small inflation rate, but a positive inflation rate. So it's all about certainty. Every now and then, of course, things are uncertain and you get shocks. Shocks, as we mentioned, are unexpected things happening. So what happens when you get unexpected or unanticipated inflation? Well, we call that a form of volatility. That makes it difficult for our agents within our economies to uh, optimally allocate their resources. And for households, that means how much to consume and how much money to save. For firms, for example, how much to produce and almost uh, also how much to invest. There are some people who are particularly going to be unhappy from an unanticipated increase in inflation. And they are, for example, people uh, on fixed incomes, like I mentioned, pensioners and also self-funded funded retirees. There are also creditors who lend money at fixed rates. Those people um, are going to lose 
because they'll get paid back the agreed upon amount, but when they receive it back, it's not going to be worth as much as they thought it's going to be thanks to this unanticipated inflation. And borrowers, on the other hand, are actually going to do quite well out of it. If you're borrowing on a fixed rate contract, you're going to gain if inflation is higher than anticipated because you don't have to pay as much back in real terms. That's why you see a lot of mortgages or mortgage contracts that you'll have with a bank in order to buy some property. They're not going to have a very, very long fixed amount. They're often going to have this variable interest rate whereby the bank can change the interest rate over time depending on changes to inflation. It's kind of like a bit of a security for the banks. So I briefly just mentioned nominal and real interest rates. Um, you should already be a little bit familiar with these terms because we spoke about <clears throat> nominal and real GDP. Nominal interest rate is really that stated on the contract <coughs> that's written down. So for pensioners, it tells them the amount the government is going to pay them every week, for example. For a, a nominal wage is the amount that's written by your employer on the contract that you sign telling you what your wage is going to be uh, each, each year. And a nominal wage increase is that increase, 3% per year, for example. But you've got to account for that inflation. So for example, in Australia, one of the big problems is though we've had strong nominal wage growth, we've had almost zero real wage growth over the last 20 years. When you account for inflation, the nominal, interest, uh, nominal wage growth is uh, minus the uh, inflation rate is about zero. And this brings us to a very simple question with what seems like a very simple answer. What causes inflation? Now, before this lecture, you might have thought to yourself, well, that's simple. It's the government printing money. The more money that's printed, the more money is in circulation, the less each note is worth. And actually, a government printing money in, in large quantities, not for the purposes of um, monetary policy, but for other reasons, can actually lead to inflation. But typically speaking, the reasons are more subtle than that. Now, if we think back to our uh, supply and demand model from microeconomics, we know that the price can adjust from shifts to either of the curves. There could be a rightward shift of the, of the demand curve or a leftward shift of the supply curve. Now, the same thing goes when we think about our aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. We could have a rightward shift of the aggregate demand curve or a leftward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve. Now, instead of the price on the y-axis, remember, we have inflation. And this corresponds to the two categories of reasons that can cause inflation. The first is called demand pull inflation. As the name suggests, this relates to the aggregate demand curve. So a large, typically unexpected increase in aggregate demand can put upward pressure on the price level in the economy, which increases inflation. That can happen, for example, if growth is too rapid, which has happened throughout history, notably in the British um, in the British Empire, or if real wages increase too quickly, thereby consumers have increased purchasing power and they go out and spend it in large quantities. Uh, more common for many of the famous historical examples of inflation is the cost push inflation. Now that comes from uh, pressure on the short run aggregate supply curve that shifts that curve to the left. Now, as we saw again in our basic demand and supply model, a leftward shift of the supply curve can come about from an increase in input prices. So if that happens to our short run aggregate supply curve across our economy, it can have the same sort of effect. For example, when oil prices began to skyrocket in the 1970s, that put uh, a lot of pressure on input prices for firms around the world, particularly the developed world, which led to an increase in inflation amongst first world um, countries. Uh, other examples of this that lead to a leftward uh, shock to the short run aggregate supply curve are anything that can um, suddenly decrease production in an economy. For example, natural disasters uh, or war. Now, um, Interestingly enough, when these sort of things happen, there can be 
a devastating spiral that leads to inflation getting out of control and that can typically lead to the government printing money. So why would the government go about printing a lot of money um, not for the purposes of monetary policy? Well, this could be if the government finds itself essentially broke and is trying to increase its revenues. Now, why would a government not have any revenue? Well, that can particularly happen in cases when, for example, it's not getting any tax revenue. And that can happen when there's a huge spike in unemployment. And why would there be a huge spike in unemployment? Well, when firms are shutting down and laying off workers. So when you've got something that happens that shifts the short run aggregate supply curve to the left, it can lead to an increase in inflationary pressure. And that, for example, can lead to a devaluation in the currency, which means that firms that typically like to export suddenly find themselves going out of business. So the spiral continues. They're laying off more and more workers. Unemployment's going up. That's decreasing the tax revenue the government gets and the government essentially tries to print its way out of trouble but by printing its way out of trouble that's just increasing pressure on inflation and once this sort of spiral gets going it can accelerate at a dramatic rate now we're talking about the reserve bank of australia trying to keep interest rates and inflation around that sort of sorry trying to keep inflation around that two to three percent level uh, and we start to think about things like um, six, seven, ten percent as being really high inflation for Australia. But once this spiral gets going, we can see some astronomical figures that blow this out of the water. This is called hyperinflation. That's when we get accelerated inflation that essentially can't be stopped. Um, like I said, that excessive money creation coming from the government printing money is usually more of a symptom and a consequence of some other underlying issue um, such as war or conflict. Um, Rome's crisis of the third century, which really destabilized the empire and began the, the, I guess, the fall of the Roman Empire, was caused by coin devaluation, but that was also a symptom of other things going on. Um, there are some, some famous examples throughout history. Germany, after World War uh, I and before World War II, faced um, incredible hyperinflation, also brought upon by pressures for war reparations. And then Hungary, towards the end of the Second World War, entered absolutely manic hyperinflation. We can see some of the numbers there on the screen. I don't even know how to pronounce things once you get to 10 to the power of 20. Um, so that's the sort of inflation we're talking about. Today, we have one example that's ongoing in hyperinflation that you'll probably have heard about from the news. Um, and that's in, that's in Venezuela, um, where essentially now people are not um, using the local currency for their trades. There's just no point anymore. There's also um, shops are not putting the price in, in the local currency anymore, but instead they're either trading using the, the US dollar or for a while they were using commodities like eggs to replace uh, coins and, and notes as currency. As we spoke about before, there are other things that can be useful um, as, uh, as money as long as they meet those characteristics. And in this case, the local currency was no longer meeting that characteristics as a store of value because it wasn't a store of value anymore, for example. So people were using things like eggs. Now look, the government, the Venezuelan government is trying to introduce some sort of a cryptocurrency to try and assuage the fears that are going on at the moment. But this is not the only example of hyperinflation throughout history. Actually, there's a very um, interesting and kind of cool YouTube video that shows um, the top 10 countries rate of inflation from 1980 uh, through to modern times. And we'll see some examples of hyperinflation there. So to finish off what's been a reasonably complicated lecture, let's have a bit of fun and look at this video and I'll give you a little bit of historical context for some of the, um, some of the stories behind the figures there. Here is a nice video you can find on YouTube uh, about the top 10 countries by inflation rate from 1980 uh, through to 2018. And it's quite interesting to see how famous events throughout history uh, are now quite uh, related to macroeconomic concepts, basic fundamental macro, macroeconomic concepts, uh, such as inflation and how governments and central banks respond to that. And um, even though macroeconomics is a relatively recent field, it's increasingly, it's becoming increasingly important 
for countries to um, to understand how it works and the different tools that they've got to respond. Because if they don't, and they try to do what the Roman Empire did and just print their way out of trouble, hyperinflation can ensue, and that can really destroy a country. So let's see then how uh, how inflation is related to events throughout history, going back to the 1980s. Now this has already skipped over a few famous examples of hyperinflation throughout history, um, such as, for example, uh, Hungary after the Second World War. You can see in the early 1980s, Bolivia uh, was sort of the first um, example in the modern age of hyperinflation. We've got inflation rates there. You can see shooting up to 5,000, 6,000%. This was essentially due to a violent military coup that happened in 1980 that led to a general strike of almost all workers in the entire country. So you can imagine this massive leftward shift of the supply curve then as as production um, stopped. In Nicaragua, it was due to a civil war that happened in the 1980s that um, drastically decreased GDP as all of production went into war type of activities um, on either side. Now, the government tried to get out of it by printing money and in 1988, inflation actually hit 14,000% uh, at, at the time. And then it was hit by a hurricane, Hurricane Joan as well, which did not help the situation. We saw Peru in there. That was another example of civil war, largely due to guerrilla warfare by uh, something called the Shining Path. Uh, and then we move on to the Congo. We'll see the Congo cropping up uh, quite a few times throughout the, the coming years. It was called Zaire at the time. Um, you might have heard of President Mobutu who was in charge of that country for a long period of time. Eventually it changed its name to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But um, essentially, when the Cold War ended around 1991, that was a real catalyst for things to go, uh, to go wrong for that country. Then in the late 1990s, actually, they got a huge influx of refugees coming from the um, Rwandan genocide. And they were actually then followed by pursuing armies on both the Hutu and Tutsi side, which led to further conflicts happening within the country. So we can see that the uh, Congo has sat at the top of the list for a long period of time. Um, Angola was another example of a civil war that went on for a period of time, started in 1998. And then we get to one of the most famous examples of hyperinflation, um, first making its appearance, that is of Zimbabwe. Now it's gonna drop off for a bit. We can actually see that the top inflation rates are not too bad considering what we've seen before. Double digits is um, not what we would call uh, hyperinflation. But although when we look at the different countries that appear on there, we can relate them to different conflicts going on, such as Iraq and so forth. But um, Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwe was mainly due to this uh, economic structural adjustment program that was um, put in place that essentially led to the eviction of white farmers um, the result being a almost a complete shutdown of the food supply. So we're talking about food production decreasing by a half suddenly. So that's a massive leftward shift um, in the supply curve, uh, which was then um, uh, made worse and compounded by printing of money. And then we get to Venezuela, one of the worst examples in modern history in a case that's still going on at the moment. Um, Sudan, of course, um, related to the civil war going on there, but Venezuela is going to kick into gear and we're about to go off the charts. This is a country which had almost 80% of its GDP related to oil, so really putting all of its eggs in one basket, but then subsequent price shocks in the, the global oil price, crude, crude oil price, led to drastic decrease in uh, government revenues, the government went into deficit, it tried to print its way out of trouble, um, combine that with a massive decrease in production, and extremely high unemployment has led to this spiraling hyperinflation, one of the worst cases that we've seen, which has led to the local currency being essentially completely ignored by the population, um, and they've moved to uh, the US dollar. Uh, at some point they were using eggs as currency, uh, and now we're moving to using a local, uh, sorry, a national cryptocurrency as an attempt to uh, try to get themselves out of, out of a hole. Uh, 
Um, so as we can see, the effects of uh, failing to respond adequately with um, macroeconomic policy and macroeconomic security can lead to dramatic and uh, sometimes explosive consequences.